Yes, as uh, Mo said, I'm an engineer by background, but I've, um, I would like to think I've evolved a little bit. Uh, and so naturally, I just am going to need to move around a little bit. Uh, so I've got, I don't know, 100 slides. How long do you want me? <laughs> just kidding. So I, I, Mo told me to talk about 30 minutes or so. But I would encourage all of you to jump in. Go ahead and raise your hand or whatever if you want to um, ask something or want some follow-up. Because I do have like 30 slides, but I'll try and blast through those and go quickly through. So uh, let me start with the bad. Uh, trash, traffic crash data. So within Orange County, or within the, the US, we see over 35,000 people killed in 2015 uh, in traffic deaths. Traffic fatalities, not just bike or ped, but riding a motorcycle, riding in a car, it could be on a train, what have you. All sorts of traffic deaths. And so that's a 747 airliner holding about 400 plus people crashing every four days. So uh, who here sees um, news articles about crashes? Uh, and what do the crashes always say? What's the terminology? I want to get at words matter. What you see is, Traffic accident on the 405, traffic accident on Jamboree. It's not an accident. There's a thing in my industry that it's a crash, not an accident. An accident is my son spilling milk. A crash in a car or on a bicycle or hitting a pedestrian is something that's preventable. It's not an accident. Accident implies that it just, throw your hands up, it's the Lord's way or whatever, it just was kind of a fate thing. That's not the case. We want to think about it differently. So I impress upon all of you to talk about it as crashes or collisions. Stop using the word accident related to traffic deaths. Uh, so then within 2015, we saw a spike. Uh, numbers went up a bit. The bike and ped increased 10, 12%. And then in Orange County, uh, the latest data that I actually have access to is 2013. In that year, 185 people killed. 5%, so that was, I think, nine people were riding a bicycle. And then 28%, uh, so there was about 50, it was, I think, 52 pedestrians that year. So within my business, I'm the active transportation coordinator at OCTA. Not the bike coordinator, not the pedestrian coordinator, covering both bicycling and walking, uh, mostly on a planning front at OCTA. Uh, <clears throat> Historically, we see a lot of energy and interest in bicycling, but the topic really needs to be broad. And in reality, you would say, given the fatalities, my energy should be about three times as much related to pedestrian safety than bicycle safety, just given the numbers of fatalities, right? Uh, but bicycling is chic. Uh, there's a, a lot more interest in it, a lot more movement in that topic. So in general, I try and cover a, a mix of things. Okay, so that's, that's the somber. We start with that. The photo on the right is a dreadful thing that I could go into more details, but we see a lot of that throughout Orange County. A lot of affected people. Maybe some of you have been involved or had some incidents. Uh, it is unfortunate and it's preventable. Okay, so then let's start talking about the good. And I'm going to cover today five E's and then maybe talk about the six interspersed, hopefully. So the first is a lot of what I do and what I come from is engineering. So the good is within Orange County, over the, since 2012, local cities have secured almost $90 million to improve our infrastructure, mostly for bicycling, but also for walking. That's in three buckets of major grant sources. The first one is the ATP program from the state of California, and the second one is uh, the, the kind of wonky named Bicycle Corridor Improvement Program, which is from OCTA, funding money that we make available at OCTA. So that's the good. So your cities are putting money towards this topic. How do we figure out where to put our infrastructure funds? Well, OCTA tries to do a lot related to this topic. Uh, one example is our Regional Bikeways Program. So since 2011, our staff got together with different city staff and advocates and community members and elected officials and said, if we were going to develop a regional bikeway network, where would it need to go? What are the big destinations like UCI, like a major shopping center, like major employment centers? 
where are those places? And let's draw lines on the map and stop thinking of Orange County as 35 different cities and county instead of 35 balkanized places just as one county. So we started ignoring the city boundaries and drew lines on the map and came up with this map, the Regional Bikeway Network. So the map on the right is relatively small for all of you. It's on our network. Uh, all the information is available on OCTA's webpage. But there's solid lines, which means existing bikeways, and dash lines for future, things that we'd like to see connected somehow. Uh, and then the dollar amount for that remaining network to build it, another $400 million. So just the backbone network, just that regional core. Not me going to the grocery store or me going to my kid's school. Not necessarily those localized networks, but just the regional network. So there's a lot to be done. There's a lot more. When we did the regional bikeway planning, we talked a lot about the types of cyclists. So look at this map and think about who you are personally. Are you uh, the 1%? We've done surveys and we said, we've got about 1% of bicyclists are categorized as strong and fearless. That is the crowd that will ride in a snowstorm to get to work or school. They can figure it out. They've got the gear. They're skilled enough and practiced enough. They don't care where they, uh, what the weather or what the situations are like. Or they also will mix it up with car traffic just fine and, and have no problem with that. 7% are enthused and confident, a crowd that probably is riding uh, more frequently, but yeah, when the weather is really terrible or they really avoid certain routes, then they might choose differently. Then you see 60% interested but concerned. So I would venture more than the, the variety or the mix of this uh, room is that interested but concerned. Probably most of you have a bicycle in your garage or at home somewhere. Maybe it's a little flat, maybe it's a little dusty. You'd like to ride more frequently, but you're concerned about your personal safety relative to what? To car traffic. So interested but concerned, if I'm a marketing person, this is my biggest market. I want to grow more bicycling activity. This is the market to think about. So when we developed our regional bikeway network, we said we want to think about the interested but concerned. The audience that might ride, but they're concerned about that personal safety issue. And 33% uh, is the no way, no how. I don't have a bike, I don't care, I'm not gonna ride a bike, I'm not comfortable, right? That, that is still a segment of our population. And when you look at the images on the screen, right, the guy on the left is wearing Lycra, he's riding to downtown LA, he's mixing up with car traffic, it's not a dedicated bike lane, that guy can tough it out. He might look a little bit like me, but you might be correct in assuming that's me. The people on the right, <laughs> People on the right is everyone else, right? My wife, my mother-in-law, my, my kids, my coworkers, all that other interested but concerned audience that says, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna do that stuff you do, Paul, but maybe on the weekend, maybe with my family on a, a trail, fully separated from car traffic, that's our desired audience, that's our market. Uh, a lot of the work, I just wanted to show that, throw this up real quick is, um, we try and account for data. Being I'm at UC Irvine, I want to talk about data. We try and account for things where uh, we can, but we also do a lot of work to get input from the community. So that might be people that ride on a regular basis and help us with routing, or people that just say, well, I would here, but I want to know what that finish the statement is from people. So we get the more input. If we just exist strictly in data, then we're not going to get the whole story. So we mix up a variety of things. And this map in particular is uh, within a, the foothills area of Orange County, we call it. So Irvine, Tustin, Orange, Villa Park, Anaheim Hills, and Yorba Linda. So each dot represents a bike crash. And this map was uh, probably five years of data. So five years of data, each one of these would just be a bike crash, not necessarily a fatality. Uh, and it's pretty easy to start spotting roadways when you stare at these types of maps. I love maps and I stare at them all the time and I think it's quite telling when we look at these types of things. You can identify what the big streets are and the places that are not very attractive to ride a bike, but they have destinations and people go there. That's where crashes are gonna happen. Yes. Do you know those distinctions? 
Typically, bike car. That's the majority of it, yes. Okay? Do you know what those areas are? I think, like, is that near campus, the bottom? I don't have a pointer. Yeah, so you get the Irvine core in between Jamboree and, say, Jeffrey. So a lot of people riding bikes just in general throughout the city. Uh, so that reflects what? Just people are out and about in Irvine. We do, Irvine does have a network, a lot of off-street trails as well as on-street trails. So that might indicate much more that there's activity within those areas. Uh, and then in orange, the band going east-west is Chapman. So I get a lot of people go, well, why are the bicycles riding on Chapman? There's no bike lanes, there's no shoulder, there's no nothing. And I say, why do you go to anything on Chapman? There's destinations, there's land uses. My favorite donut shop, right? The pancake house, all those different things, those are destinations. Or it might not be that I'm going to frequent that business, but I work there, right? So people still need to get to those places. Bicycling isn't always just about recreation and taking the less uh, heavily traveled route. It's going somewhere. It's a primary mode of transportation for a lot of people. Uh, so you get Chapman, which I'm that guy. I'm that strong and fearless, and I don't ride Chapman past a certain point. I, I don't, right? Like, I'm thinking that that's just not going to happen. There's a couple roads, Tustin and Chapman in this area. Tustin is the north-south, just west of the 55. Those are streets that I avoid even if I'm trying to go to a destination on there. So those are, the, those are the most obvious ones. And I would say in general, that's people that are going to work that get hit or people that are going to those businesses and get hit. Okay, let me keep going. All right, so ne now what's next? I talked about the regional bikeway system. I, I talked earlier about all the collisions and fatalities. The next thing is a countywide active transportation plan. So there's been a lot of work at OCTA for regional bikeways. A lot of the cities have done work on local bikeway networks. Now we're going to create an active transportation plan that will roll in all that bikeway planning, but also spend some time, a lot of time, on pedestrian analysis. So we want to get deep into the data. We want to get public input for people to tell us where are the places, where are the areas throughout the county that could get better for walking. And we can hopefully, in the long run, we can reduce those injuries and fatalities. Bless you. Uh, Oh, did I? Yeah. So what did I miss there? Skateboarding. Skateboarding is definitely qualifies. Yeah, so Mo reminds me to not just skip over rolling devices, right? On the photo with the audiences, there was, uh, I think, a gentleman in a wheelchair, right? The, a rolling uh, mobility assistance device. So skateboards or any sort of rolling device is, is very important as well. We need to think about that beyond just people walking to and fro. Um, so we're getting started on this. It's about to begin. I'm having my kickoff with the consultant next week or in two weeks. Okay, so a lot of my work is engineering, but also I'm going to dip into some of the other things that we do. I want to talk about evaluation, another E. Uh, here's a good example of how we don't have data about bicycling or walking. This is a map from the Newport Beach Bicycle Master Plan prepared a few years ago. In this, we show bigger dots for where the bicycling activity was observed. Volunteers went out and they counted bicyclists during a certain time frame. The bigger dots means the highest frequency. So the location that saw the most was pretty much where the Santa Ana River joins with Coast Highway. Uh, we had a location there. And then there was a big one over here with uh, East Bluff going into Back Bay. So at those locations, you can, they naturally fit with off-street trails, really strong off-street trails that a lot of people enjoy riding. But this is a sprinkling of the community. If you wanted to know how many cars travel on any of these roadways, the city has it, OCTA has it. If you want to know how many people walk or bike on these roadways, this is all I have. This is it. We do not have data on bicycling and walking. So we're hoping to collect data going forward. The point of that is exposure rates. We don't really know, we know the volume of collisions, but how bad is it? That's, that's a question that we have. We've tried to get some data. Strava is an app that bicyclists will use or other uh, people exercising to be able to track their activity. Distance walked, distance bicycling, that kind of thing. Swimming, all that information. We actually purchased some of the Strava Metro data that is available. 
and then modeled it. And our GIS guys wonked out on this for a bit. They, they modeled what Strava told us, and then they also modeled it using our typical traffic analysis models. The two don't match at all. Uh, so another indication that we just need better information. And the, one of the problems with the Strava data is it's a self-selecting audience. It is not the broad-based audience. It is not the people that are riding on Chapman. It is not the people that are in Santa Ana, for example. A lot of North Orange County, as I explain it, is dark on this map. It does not reflect reality in terms of how many people are out riding. So, as a result, we wrote a grant and we're going to begin a study at OCTA to figure out roles and responsibilities. What is, what is a good role for OCTA to help collect data about bicycling and walking? What type of technology would make sense? Where would we collect that data? All that's about to begin because we got a grant for it from the state of California. And then uh, another grant that we wrote uh, is to go out and look at all that crash data. All the bicycling and uh, pedestrian crash data and try and look for trends. So we're calling it the systemic safety analysis. Uh, so we're going to really categorize all the collisions based on where they occur. Is it a four lane road or a six lane road? Was it a neighborhood two lane road? Uh, was it a major intersection, a traffic signalized intersection or some other thing? Did it occur most frequently on those places at night, on the weekend, whatever? Like really dig and slice and dice all that data and then try and come up with what are good infrastructure solutions as well as non-infrastructure. So infrastructure is paint and concrete type things. Non-infrastructure would be education or encouragement campaigns. If we found it's a certain demographic, language barrier issues or so-and-so just moved here and back home, they, t they tell people to ride against traffic, right, as a bicyclist or as a pedestrian that you could cross anywhere. How do, we, how do we figure out what specific segments need to be addressed? So this study is about to begin as well. So these are all engineering slash evaluation studies. Then enforcement. This is a personal topic I'm interested in trying to grow. Uh, so enforcement, we talk a lot about engineers making things better, uh, people analyzing data, but the police are on the ground every day patrolling the community and trying to figure out where to spend their resources. So an idea now that we've developed and we're gonna get a grant from Southern California Association of Governments, SCAG, is for us to do a, a specific module with police officers. For us to go in there and say, we've looked at all the bicycle and pedestrian collision data and identified the top behaviors associated with crashes. They're probably things that we would expect. Motorists not yielding to pedestrians in the crosswalk. Motorists speeding. Bicyclists riding against traffic uh, on the wrong side of the street. Uh, pedestrians crossing outside of a, a crosswalk or mid-segment and not in a good location, essentially. What behaviors are there? And then do kind of a refresher for bike and ped laws. Given where we are today, a lot of officers maybe learned about the topic in the academy, but they don't have much of a refresher. This is a chance for us to touch base on that. Not teaching police, but just giving them the information, right? Uh, and then also some common ground. So really transportation of professionals like myself and police we're not hanging out together. We're not doing a whole lot of interaction, a not, not a lot of partnerships or collaboration historically. So hopefully this will kickstart that a little bit. Okay. Any questions? I'm, I'm just blasting through. Okay. Education. So another role at OCTA that I provide uh, is trying to host training opportunities. So here's a sampling of examples. Safe routes to school uh, is a a whole design philosophy about how to encourage kids to walk and bike to school. They cover a, a mix of different approaches, education and encouragement and engineering as well. Uh, so a role that we provide at OCTA is training for city staff, for them to better understand all the different tools in the toolkit about how to improve biking and walking, or also doing design training uh, opportunities. We've had staff from Caltrans come talk about a protected bikeway design standard that just came about recently, or even talking about roadway reconfigurations or road diets, as many people know it, 
or in Santa Ana, as they call it, lane, uh, road buffets. Has anyone heard that? Yeah. Right? Besides Mo. So no one likes a diet. This is the Santa Ana line. A diet means you're missing out on something that you used to have and it was great. So get rid of the road diet term, which is all about like reducing the number of travel lanes and making a street function better for many reasons and make it a buffet. We're gonna look at the roadway section from the curb to the curb and say, pick and choose what pieces you want to make this road or this street function better. So anyways, we've done the training for that and try and host those types of things. Usually it's more for city staff, but also for the community. What's next? Okay, so then uh, we didn't test out the video, so we can uh, see how it works. But um, at OCTA, we also have marketing staff. I'm not a marketer, that's not my skill set, but we've got staff that have done a mix of different things. Every month is, every May is bike month, so we do a whole May bike month festivities with different events and promotions and encourage people to pledge to ride and get out there and exercise. But also there's campaigns like the I Give Three Feet. The three foot law was passed a few years ago as a motorist, when you're passing a bicyclist, you must pass a bicyclist with at least three feet of space. And as a bicyclist, I would encourage you to just entirely change lanes and go around so that you're giving that much more space. Uh, so that was a, a law that was passed a few years ago and took effect, is now law, so all of you should know. Somehow, all of you would have gotten the message, hopefully. Other things about being bright, being visible when you're out walking and bicycling, uh, or behaviors, the image on the right. So let me see if I can, okay. So uh, our staff have developed a couple videos. Hopefully this comes up okay. Uh, we can always send the link out, I suppose, later. You don't get this close in person, so don't act like this when driving. Give people on bikes room to ride. California state law requires at least three feet of passing space. The point is, I kind of want to know what's going on right now. <laughs> my bubble, right? My personal space. Everyone's got personal space. The message at the end is, you don't get close to people in your daily life, give a bicyclist three feet as you pass it, right? Uh, so, okay, so then, um, <clears throat> I always feel like I date myself when I also talk about the don't be a salmon. Um, does, raise your hand if you know about the honey badger, honey badger videos, right? Okay, so half and half, thank you. <laughs> I've spoken to high school students and they look at me like I'm crazy when I talk about the honey badger. So the bike salmon video, uh, the upper left, the message was don't be a salmon, which is going upstream or against traffic. Don't ride against traffic. We found that that was a good 30 to 40% of all bicycle crashes throughout Orange County. So we had a video for that one about the bike salmon and it was, it showed a salmon and it was the same guy that narrated, the same guy, Randall, that narrated the honey badger video. So that had a message at the end as well. Uh, and even swearing, uh, it got beeped, but this is OCTA, this is a public agency. We did a promotional, a PSA video that had a swear word, like that's crazy town, right? So <laughs> if, if we went to the YouTube page and I showed you some of the older OCTA stuff or some other PSAs you've seen about bicycling and walking, usually it's, it's like feel good stuff or an officer in front of a cruiser telling you it's the law somehow at the end, right? So those kinds of boring PSAs, people click through or they ignore outright. Uh, so we had the three foot, the salmon. The good point is um, when I look just at the YouTube page for these videos, I've highlighted people say like, yeah, this was the first ad I didn't skip. Something that still caught their attention. Our goal was add some humor, something that people will share and actually would be interested to watch. Only at the end, do you get a little bit about a bicyclist? You guys saw the three foot video. It was just all these other personal interactions. Only at the end was there a bicyclist. Uh, so we, we caught you right at the end, it gets into it. 
So our marketing staff have been able to give, um, have been able to push the envelope a little bit and get creative on developing those. So I'm happy to say that. Let me keep going. Uh, so then encouragement. So I've got, uh, we have the boards down here. Pull this up. This is the, um, Skag created this. Where's their logo? It's down here, real light. Skag has developed this Go Human campaign. This is their branded uh, Just Do It, right? Nike had Just Do It when it probably came out. It probably sounded a little weird. Now it's just commonplace. Skag is aiming for the same type of thing with their tag, Go Human. So the Go Human campaign is all about encouraging bicycling and walking and trying to improve safety. So they, Skag has developed these uh, boards and marketing campaign about personalizing and humanizing the interaction for people, uh, for interaction with other bicyclists or pedestrians. So there's a mix of different boards here. Um, and Skag is, so they've done a marketing campaign, but they've also done these different events. So here you see in the city of Westminster last year, a location where there was this big intersection uh, in a neighborhood Four-way stop for a day, we tested out a roundabout. Uh, the woman on the rollerblades is uh, one of the members of the teen council. So I was there that day and we had the teen council actually build the roundabout, right? We gave them a general, like, it needs to be this big and we chalked out the lines and then they got to assemble all the pieces and have a, have a role in that. Uh, so the Go Human event in the city of Westminster, uh, tested out that roundabout, also a protected bikeway. Who wants to ride on this street in front of that trash truck, right? I don't even, yeah. And I might be that enthu um, that 1% crowd like strong and fearless, but that's, that's crazy town. No one wants to do that, right? So we took this street, this is Hoover Street in the city of Westminster, and for the day, tested out a protected bikeway. All we did is put up some flimsy barriers and some trees and you get uh, this person riding this protected bikeway, a two-way bikeway, it's still on the street, uh, not on the sidewalk, not an off-street trail. <clears throat> he was willing to ride that. And the first slide showed a whole family of people. I think I've got more. Here's another angle. Yeah, so this, I show this photo because I love it. This family would never ride Hoover Street on any other day, except for the day that we did the Go Human event and we tested out the barrier. So the fact is when we talk about that 60%, the interest but concern, they will ride on the street if you give them some sort of barrier. So then it, what I'm doing with engineers and other city staff is figuring out how do we make something like that go from temporary to permanent, okay? And SCAG through the Go Human events is trying to get the word out and try and let cities test these ideas. So there's, the good news is there's more to come. In 2017, we're supposed to have multiple events in all the cities that are listed there. And uh, no joke, in Garden Grove on April 1st, they're gonna do an event as well. It'll be their third Open Streets event. They've actually done two already. Yeah, we call it Open Streets. It's closed to car traffic, but open to everyone else. Uh, the city's gonna do a, an event. Uh, so the e-blast just came out on Friday. So I popped that in this uh, reimagine our streets in Garden Grove. So a lot of great things happening in cities like Garden Grove or Westminster that you wouldn't, you don't hear about too much otherwise. And then more to come as well. All right, I think I'm almost done. So something I wanted to highlight, Mo and I have connected because we kind of go to the same things all the time. And part of it is just community partners, right? At OCTA, I could just be at my desk all day long and wait for people to come to me, but I'm trying to go out and interact and get to know all these different groups. Who are the community advocates? Who are the uh, public health officials and people interested in public health? Or who are the people representing schools that all wanna see improved health, improved safety, uh, better transportation choices for their, their audience, their group that they're focused on? Uh, we all have different outcomes, I suppose, that we're looking for, but the means is similar. More choices and more opportunities for people to bicycle and walk. So SAS, uh, the, there's a couple of acronyms up there. SAS is Santa Ana Active Streets. It's a loose uh, 
group of advocates in the city of Santa Ana trying to improve things. And then uh, KPOC is Community Action Partnership of Orange County. I think they're much more focused on food and housing, but then they've kind of been pulled into transportation as well. And then AHOC, uh, Alliance for a Healthy Orange County. So you've got a lot of people focused on public health who realize active transportation and physical activity is super important. So they're getting at their, a seat at the table and talking a lot with us. Okay, and then um, here's my call to action for all of you, right? You're not just students, you're members of the community. There are all these different ways for you to be involved. Speak up, we're about to begin our active transportation plan. So be involved, keep track, just get on the distribution list, look for activities or opportunities, or look at our document and comment on it. Um, or look at a document that's now publicly available. Caltrans just released last week their statewide bicycle and pedestrian plan. It's much more of a, a policy document for the organization for Caltrans, but it affects all of us in different ways. Caltrans doesn't just focus on the 405 or the 55, but also streets like Beach Boulevard, Coast Highway, Laguna Canyon Road, all those streets that have a number associated with them, pretty much our Caltrans run. So you can comment on that. The link is there. It's relatively easy to find a statewide bike and ped plan. And comments are due March 10. It's just the draft document at this point. Uh, and speak to your representatives. So I have a, a board of elected officials. They're generally city council members from throughout Orange County. Uh, they are only going to push and support my activities if they hear from their constituents. Same thing on the statewide level or the national level. If you talk to them, just like there's a lot of discussion about calling your representative for a whole mix of reasons right now, the same thing you could do as well about improving bicycling or walking in your community. As long as they actually hear some of that from their constituents, then they know it's important. And then attend things like the Open Streets event and other activities that occur throughout the community or engage, be a part of a local advocacy group. I know as a consultant in the private sector, we typically were hiring staff who were out there. They were there, they were participating in the community above and beyond class, right? Here at UCI, you're only getting so much, but going into the community and um, learning how to wrench a bike or helping organize an activity and make it awesome to help kids, whatever. All those types of things make you stand out from the rest of the competition. So with that, I think I wanted to open it up for questions. Does anyone have anything they want to, burning questions they want to ask? Yes. Um, so when you look into doing things like creating the safe bike lanes that you showed the picture of um, that were temporary, what are the most common barriers you face to making that more permanent? Is it like mostly a funding thing or is there pushback from car drivers or where are the barriers to making that more permanent infrastructure? Yeah. Yeah, right. We've got it on video, so I'll try and repeat the best I can. Uh, the question was, um, flip too far. So the question was, uh, what are the common barriers to making this permanent, right? This on the screen being a protected bikeway, improved infrastructure for bicycling and walking. And what we see is really uh, within the community, I would say biggest barriers is this common expectation that transportation agencies like OCTA or your city, the best way that they can address traffic is to get me there faster, A to B. How can I drive there faster? And somehow it's gonna make my quality of life better. That's gonna make my day better. The reality is that is a, a car centric thinking and it's limited to one mode of transportation. So that is that permeates culture, right? That permeates everyone's thinking. When I talk about being a cultural engineer at this point, I am, I'm talking a lot more about psychology and people's thinking and what's normal and what's not. And providing more transportation choices means people need to start thinking about more opportunities, more choices beyond just getting people there faster, right? The reality is speed kills. There's a lot of data to point that this would be great and this would improve the community. But the resistance we're gonna get is, but that's gonna make traffic hell. And I would say, fine, that might be okay if this city says, I prefer or I would hire, um, prioritize bicycling and walking. 
and we need to provide something on this street, right? Every city needs to figure out where they are relative to policies and what's most important or where they need to prioritize things. And historically, as a traffic engineer or in the business, we've prioritized people driving fast and getting somewhere quick. So there's a lot of um, kind of cultural norms that we need to get over. Uh, the reality is there is money for these types of things. The cities that work with the community and they identify the best places and they make a policy decision and they say, I'm okay with what traffic impacts might occur there. Or even if there's none, I still see cities that are resistant to this because it's, it's kind of a new crazy talk, right? There's just not a lot of it happening. We're not repurposing our streets a whole lot. So a lot of natural resistance to this. It's not a routine project. If a city came to you and said, hey, we're going to widen this street, uh, the typical reaction is, great, it'll make my life better. In reality, now what I'm suggesting is that the cities look at their streets and say, where can you actually reduce the number of travel lanes and still make life better for your residents and your community? And so because it's not routine, we were kind of turning things around, there's, there's a lot of resistance. Uh, and, and it's more psychology and social norms than engineering issues or funding issues. Okay, next, anyone else? So I kind of just want to talk more about that because I think the difficulty as a driver personally, if you're commuting, it's hard to argue, like if I worked and lived and spent 75% of my time in Irvine, I would be on board with that. But I think to say that it's okay if traffic increases, it then doesn't that sort of, it puts pressure on those who leave, leave the city to go other places. So I think in line with that thinking, you also need to possibly take into account, maybe we need to improve, improve like public transportation. You bike to the bus. And then I think it's unfair to drivers then because we're not just commuting five miles, you're commuting 30, 40 miles and you're leaving the city. So, I mean, is that, I could see how that would be like a big issue for pushback because yeah. that's a very, bikers tend to be, live and work in the same area. It's hard to like bike more than 10 or 20 miles in the morning. So is that kind of a problem, like a viewpoint you guys take like in regards to using public transportation? As yeah, so definitely. So then what, what's becoming quickly apparent, right, is there's all these like balancing issues, right? So we talk a lot about trade-offs. So if you say, well, Hoover Street, the volumes on this street are not really tremendous. Actually, if we reduce a travel lane, the street will still accommodate the traffic volumes that are there today. Those are kind of low hanging fruit opportunities. The more challenging opportunities or situations is where you have high traffic volumes on a road and it's really gonna be up to that city council, that community to say, we're okay with a certain roadway, whether it's Chapman or 17th or Tustin Avenue or Irvine Boulevard, having more traffic because we want to better balance or we want to better accommodate other modes. The reality is that historically we've just said, forget all those other modes. We're going to prioritize things for people driving a car. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that then no one wants to ride a bike anywhere. No one wants to take a bus anywhere. Uh, no one wants to take the train. Everyone says these, all these other choices really lag and they don't function as well. Uh, so then you get a lot of good policy discussion that comes out of that. Then you start thinking about well, where are people going to and from and what choices are there and why, why is cost of housing really affecting all this? Why does that matter so much? Or how do we link with our transportation system? Right, The iShuttle uh, links up with the Tustin Metrolink station. Well, so how much does that work for everybody, right? Or maybe I could take Metrolink into downtown LA, but there's no Wi-Fi on Metrolink, so I can't really work when I'm going to work. How can we make those things better? All those things are all interrelated and connected and are much more of a policy discussion. Yeah. Other questions in the back?
Okay, and then, sorry, I didn't repeat the last question, but on this one, uh, the discussion about a major barrier being people's concern about motorists, right? Other motorists, your motorists, all of you probably drove here or are gonna get in a car today and drive somewhere. Uh, so are you that aggressive driver in the car commercial in downtown LA? Speeding to the next red light or maybe catching the next green? Or always going five miles above the speed limit? Uh, because, well, we know that police aren't gonna pull us over for that. Or are you following the speed limit or maybe even going a little slower? Uh, Think about your own behavior on a regular basis, but the point, the question was a little bit more about uh, how do we target and how do we address motorist behavior, uh, which is a, a clear barrier for things like kids walking and biking to schools. Uh, so that's, that's an ongoing thing. Uh, the, I would point to everyone to the Caltrans document. The state bike and ped plan has recommendations about more training at the DMV, uh, more training directly to motorists about better behavior for bicycling and walking. We've done some of that with our marketing campaigns. Our marketing campaigns have not just been for bicyclists and pedestrians, but also include motorists as well. The best behaviors one uh, caters specific, specific to that recently. So uh, really there's, there's a lot more that could be done, but those are the most obvious things now. Thank you, sir. Yeah, other, oh, don't call me sir though, yeah. <laughs> Now well, I'm old, but not that old. Yeah. That, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, so then the question was uh, partnerships and funds uh, to help get the word out more. Um, a lot of the things that I showed on the screen are grants that we've secured at OCTA to do different studies or different things. Uh, one example specifically is the office, office of Traffic Safety. It's a state board that has money they dole out typically to law enforcement officers to do DUI enforcement. They also do other things. Uh, like distribution of bike helmets or bike lights or officers going to schools and doing bike rodeos with people specifically. So at OCTA last year we applied for one of those grants and we got some money to create some more videos that are specific to bike and ped safety. Uh, and then we're always looking for more of those opportunities. There is money out there and really the partnerships and collaboration shows that someone's really got a lot of energy behind the topic and they figured out how to get the word out more. So um, there's no absence of opportunity. It's really just people coming together a lot of times to uh, say, yeah, let's work together on this. Are we giving 